Hey, church, how we doing? Hey, it's good to be with you guys. I, I love being in the presence of the Lord with all of you, and I love that we have kids in the building again. There's just a different energy in here. I love it. So I'm fired up. And uh, really glad you joined us today. And, and to you online, if you're out there, just so glad you're tuning in to be a part of this. We're kicking off a new series, and I've been excited to kick off this series and uh, talk about the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're going to be in the chapter or the Gospel of John for a lot of this. So if you want to open up to the Gospel of John, grab your Bibles and do that. There's seat, there's, actually, I don't know if we keep Bibles under the seats right now. So you can just grab it on your phone or grab the one you brought with you. But we're going to be doing that. And as you do, uh, I want to ask you a question. And you've probably been asked this one before. And the question is, if you could have dinner or lunch with one person, past or present, who would you choose? Who would that person be? Just who's the first couple people that come to mind for you? Online out there, if you can just type it in, let us know. Like put some names out there so we can hear who you would want to have dinner with or who you'd want to talk with. For me, when I think about that, names come to mind. I got a lot of them that come to mind, but one of them would be Abraham Lincoln. I think it'd be fun to see what that guy look, really looked like and to talk leadership with him. I think that'd be fun. I have a grandpa I never met. His name was Ray, my mom's father. And my mom always said, you're, you're a lot like your grandpa, Joel, but I never met the guy. It was to sit down, imagine having a conversation with him. That'd be so cool just to meet him, get a sense of his personality. But the honest answer is, I mean, I'm a pastor, so whatever. I'm, you know, I'll give you the church answer. I really would choose Jesus. I mean, I would want to sit and talk to Jesus and hear what he said. I mean, just imagine what, how revolutionary one conversation with Jesus could actually be. That'd be wild. I mean, the questions you could ask him, and I mean, knowing what we know of him, that'd be incredible. And what's interesting about Jesus, who was God, is God, right? You could, there was a time in history where you could actually ask Jesus out for dinner. I mean, that's kind of crazy. And I just want you to put yourself back in the day and Jesus is around and you walk up. You can work up the courage like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. And you go and you ask Jesus, say, hey, hey, Jesus, can, will you have dinner with me? And he looks you right in the eye and he says, no. <laughs> no, um, I, I, I actually have something else to do. Um, and I'm kind of busy, but I'll tell you what, don't feel bad because there is somebody I think you should have, I, you can actually talk with, and I think it'll be better if you meet with this person than, than me, which is a weird thing for Jesus to say, right? You'd be like, wait, you're, you're God, aren't you? Because I kind of know who you are. So you're Jesus. So who's better to meet with uh, than you? And what's weird about the little scenario I've cooked up is it actually happened. That actually went down. It's a conversation Jesus had with a group of people and it shocked them. There's this whole section in the Gospel of John dedicated to this one long conversation that Jesus has with the disciples. Uh, it's called the Last Supper. It actually was the Last Supper. And it was the last time. And in the middle of that conversation, he drops this bombshell announcement to the guys. He says, hey, I'm leaving. And where I'm going, you, you can't come with me. And the disciples hear that and they go, What? Like, are you serious? And they have reason to be worried, the disciples, because they had dropped everything to be with Jesus. They went with him, uh, gave up family, gave up jobs, gave up careers, and they have a reason to be kind of freaking out because they're not like the most developed guys. These are young guys, and Jesus is saying, I'm going to leave. Like at the height of his powers, right in the middle of, of his ministry, he says to these guys, uh, I'm going to go. It would be like your parents saying to you when you're 12, hey, God, you know what? I think you got this figured out. I'm out. We're out. You guys, you go ahead and figure it out. That's what that would feel like. And Jesus knows that the, the disciples are really struggling and wrestling with this. So this is what he says to comfort them. These are Jesus' words of comfort. Listen to what he says. He says, But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. I mean, he knows. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper or the comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so he just said to the disciples, not going to have dinner with you anymore. I'm out. He actually said that. This isn't going to happen anymore. Uh, I'm going to be busy doing something else, which, by the way, was just forgiving sin, overcoming the world, and then preparing a place for us in our Father's house. So no small task, right? It's not like he isn't doing something for us, but he's not going to be around anymore. And he goes, I know that makes you guys sad. I know you're scared, but trust me, it's actually, this is like Jesus at his most sales pitchy. It's actually better that I go. Don't worry, guys, because who I'm sending, this comforter, is really something special. And the comforter that Jesus is talking about is the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus seems to think that the Holy Spirit, to actually be in the presence of the Holy Spirit, is better than being in the presence of Jesus Christ. 
And what he's saying is, I, I, this Holy Spirit will come. And we know the Holy Spirit did come because we can read about it in the Bible. And he's saying, I actually want this for you. This Holy Spirit is meant to be sent to you better than me in my place, a comforter. And I want you to be in such a close relationship with this Holy Spirit that you never feel apart from me. He wants us to be in such an intimate and close relationship as his followers uh, that uh, it's even better than being with him. And the problem, though, is that uh, many of us are not. We're not in that kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit. We don't have that deep, intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. We might think we do, but it's actually a pretty passive relationship. And there's a lot of reasons for this, I think. And a couple of them are is that we just don't really understand the Holy Spirit, right? We don't know who He is. We don't know how to interact with the Holy Spirit. We don't, we don't know. And what I've realized as a pastor over the years is that we talk occasionally about the Holy Spirit, but we don't really understand we don't really even talk about the Holy Spirit enough. We don't, we don't spend enough time explaining who this person in our life is. And so uh, we've decided to have a, a series just focused on the Holy Spirit. And we're calling it The Comforter Has Come. Not is going to come, but has come. And he's come to us, and we've got to understand who this Comforter is. And so we're going to spend some time digging into questions like, who is the Holy Spirit? Now, how does the Holy Spirit work? What are the gifts of the Spirit? How do you pray in the Spirit? How do you have a relationship with the Spirit? We're going to talk about all that stuff. And to begin this series, we're going to wrestle with the question, today, who? Who's the Holy Spirit? Who is this Holy Spirit? And to answer that question, we're going to look at the first things that Jesus says to the disciples about who the Holy Spirit is. He explains the Holy Spirit to them, and we're going to look at those words. And the words we're going to look at come from John 14, uh, verse 15. And if you have your Bibles, let's follow along with me in this. Um, but uh, this is right after he tells them I'm going to leave. So he says, I'm leaving. They're all freaking out and asking questions, and this is the first thing that he says to them about the Holy Spirit, and it reveals a ton about who this uh, person is. So this is what he says. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And so he gives this incredible explanation of the Holy Spirit to them. And then he goes through it. Now, what I want to do today is actually, this, there's so much here. I want to go line by line through this so we can understand who Jesus really is saying this Holy Spirit is and what this all really means. So let's start with that first line. It says, if you love me, keep my commands. And so Jesus articulates who it is that can receive the Holy Spirit. And the only people that can receive the Holy Spirit are the people who love Jesus. And how do you know if you love Jesus? It's not necessarily just, I just raise my hand or I say I love Jesus. The way we know you love Jesus is by actually doing what he says. And the promise is, he says, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And the way we know we love Jesus is by doing what he says. And if we obey him, this is the promise that he gives us. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. And so what he's saying is, Jesus is saying, I will pray, and God will, the Father, send a comforter. How many people are in that conversation? It's a complicated one. Three people, right? There's this, there's the Father, there's the Son, and then there's this, this comforter, which is a very Trinitarian statement, right? Now, what's the Trinity? And let me tell you, if that's confusing, you're like, wait a minute, what? I thought we had one God, and there's three people, and wait, what's going on here? Let me tell you a little bit about what Christians believe about God. We believe that God exists in three persons in one Godhead, right? And you're like, wait, what? Okay, here, this is how this works, okay? All, the Holy Spirit, or, the, or God the Father, okay, is not God the Son. God the Son is not God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is not God the Father. But all are yet one God. All three exist as one person. Nobody's superior or inferior to the others. They all have the same attributes. They're all God. They're all one. And so God is one. That's how we understand God. Now, we all kind of understand. We have a good sense of the, the idea of there being a father. We get that, God. And then the son, that makes sense. But the comforter that he mentions, I mean, the Holy, we're not sure about this Holy Spirit, right? I mean, if we're honest, we're like, I mean, who is this Holy Spirit? And it's, it's interesting because <laughs> Jesus doesn't say, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. He uses a different word. And it's almost untranslatable in English. Like, we don't really have a word for it. And the word he uses is this Greek word, parakletos, or paraclete. Not parakeet, paraclete. And the way we understood that and remembered it in seminaries, we had a softball team, and we, we named ourselves the paracletes. Get it? Paracletes and like that. It's a nerdy seminary joke. Bear with me. But that's how we understood it. Paraclete. Now, what that word means 
is someone who is sent in. Somebody who, like God sends in. It's like a lawyer. I mean, it's not as fun a term, but it's like a lawyer sent in to help you kind of deal with being prosecuted. A paraclete is always somebody who's sent in to help. That's the idea behind it. And I don't really like the definitions. of the, Your Bible might say advocate or helper, which I don't always find as uh, interesting a definition. Uh, I like the word comforter. And I like it because of, uh, in, in English, the, the way we used to talk about comforter, that word had so much more meaning. It was so deeper in meaning. Uh, because when we hear in our day, well, like a comforter, we think somebody who comes and gives you like a big hug and kind of helps deal with your pain and kind of pats you on the back. That's what we think of a comforter, which is totally true. The Holy Spirit does that for sure. Definitely, I mean, if you're struggling with pain, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit wants to get in your life and love on you and just and, and live in, I mean, really, the Holy Spirit does that, but we can't limit the work of the Holy Spirit just to sympathy. The work of the Holy Spirit is so much more engaging and alive and it wants to do so much more. The, the English word for comfort that we actually get that from comes from the Latin word fortis, which means brave, like fortify. And so the, the idea of a, the Latin idea of a comforter was somebody who brought courage to fearful people. You know, you think of like a general walking into his soldiers and saying, and they're scared to go to battle, and he speaks a word of, of, of encouragement to those, to those soldiers. Think of it more like Braveheart. You ever see Braveheart? I mean, I love that movie. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Great film. There's this scene in Braveheart where it, the whole movie's about these Scottish people who are trying to have, um, trying to keep their independence and freedom from England who wants to take them over. And they're led by this guy named William Wallace, and the time comes where they're actually ready to go to battle. And they're this ragtag group of kind of peasants. They're not real well organized. They have cheap weapons. And they see the English army out there standing in front of them. And they're all regimented in their perfect gear. And they just lose their nerve. And they say, you know what? We want to go home. <laughs> We're out. Like, we can't fight these guys. We're certainly going to lose. And then in comes William Wallace on this horse. And he's got war paint on his face. And he looks at his men. And he gives this speech, if you've heard it. He says, I see a country full of men ready to fight for their freedom. And he says, you can go home, but you'll wish that you had this one day back where you could stand and fight. And he says, they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. And everybody cheers. And it's like, and at home, I'm like, I'll go fight for you, man. Look, let's go. And they go out and they whoop the English in battle. And that, that is what the Holy Spirit is actually wanting to do. One of his roles isn't just to put a hug up on us so he'll do that, but he wants to speak life into us. He wants to speak uh, encouragement and give us courage to go and do whatever is in front of us, to face whatever battle is in front of us, and to carry out the mission of God. That's what the Holy Spirit's trying to do with inside of us. We don't always tap into that kind of power, but it's wild stuff that wants to flow from within us. And so he's speaking to the disciples. He uses that word because he's saying, yeah, you're scared that I'm going. Let me tell you who's coming. The paraclete is going to come and give you the strength and the courage to carry out the mission that we started. That's who's coming. And once they know, hey, we're in good hands, he says, let me tell you about this Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what he's like. And he goes on to say this to them. This wild little statement, he says, he will abide with you forever. He will never leave you. He will abide with you forever. Packed, big promise. Now notice, he doesn't say it will abide with you forever. He says he will abide with you forever. Why does he say he? Because you can't have a relationship with an it, and he's talking about a person. You can't have a relationship with an it, but you can with a he and a person. Let me give you an example. I love my bike. I ride my bike all the time. Uh, I spend a lot of time with my bike. I don't have a relationship with my bike. It's an it. Okay, I also love my wife. I spend a lot of time with my wife. Last week, we got away for the first time. It's been over a year that we've had an actual night away with each other. Went to Green Lake. Uh, we had one of the best times. We, we didn't even know hard, hardly what to do with ourselves. And we all, all of a sudden just did like 50 things together. It was one of the best times we've had in so long. It was so relieving. Now, what if I explain that experience to you like this? I love my wife. Love hanging out with her. Last weekend, I had a great time with it. Right? Imagine if I call my wife an it from the pulpit. How dehumanizing and disrespectful would that be? I mean, I don't know if I'd recover with the ladies around here. <laughs> that guy's a jerk. I knew it. It's just... <laughs> and then the conversation I'd have to have with my wife, it'd be awful. And yet, how often do we refer to the Holy Spirit as an it? I've said things like, oh, I love the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we, should, we need more of it. 
All right, let me, the Holy Spirit, let me describe the Holy Spirit to you. It's like the wind. In fact, I'm not even kidding you. I got done saying we shouldn't refer to the Holy Spirit as an it last service, and Ben came up after and said, Joe, do you realize you called the Holy Spirit an it three times yet in the sermon? He's like counting for me. I'm like, oh, gosh. <laughs> Did I really? <laughs> I'm like, come on, get it together, Joel. Now, you might think, Joel, you're picking nits. Why is that such a big deal? Like, this whole theological system is built around the impersonal force of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. There's no personality there. And, and the problem with that is, the problem with the view of just thinking that, that this is some impersonal force is, is, is if you don't see the Holy Spirit as a person, you'll, you'll never develop a personal relationship with him or with God. It's that important. It means that much. Why? Because you can't have a personal relationship with a nit. I still never to this day pulled up a chair next to my bike and said, hey, buddy, can we talk? Can I just share how I'm feeling with you? Would that be cool? You mind? You know, like, I don't do that. I don't do that with my bike. No, to have a real relationship with the Holy Spirit, what we need to do is we need to start seeing him as a person. We need to start understanding the Holy Spirit has a personality. It is a person, which means we got to understand what is a person? What defines a person? Obviously, we could go into all kinds of philosophical debate here, but let me just explain how a Christian thinks of a person. This is how we define personhood. A person has a soul. You have a soul. And a person with a soul has a mind and a heart. And it has emotions, okay? God has a soul. Jesus has a soul. And, and you have a soul because you're made in the image of God. Did you know that? You have a soul. You have all these things. You have emotions. You have all, all kinds of great stuff about you. Well, if you read the scriptures, you'll see the Holy Spirit has a soul too. It's right in there. It's a person. And if you want to have real, see, I just did it again. He's a person. See? Busted in real time. That language reveals what we really think about the Holy Spirit. And it blocks us from having a, a relationship. If we want to have a real relationship with the Holy Spirit, we have to start seeing the Holy Spirit as a person. We have to rid ourselves of that, 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 that confusion. And here's why it matters. Okay, Here's why that matters. Jesus says, he will abide with you forever. Abide is a relational term. We've been talking about abiding all year, how important it is to abide with Jesus Christ. He said, the Holy Spirit will abide with you forever. Abide means dwell with, be in relationship with. You ever wonder how you have a personal relationship with God? It is because the Holy Spirit is abiding with us personally. That's why. That's why this is so important. And so when Jesus says he will abide with you, he's saying have, the Holy Spirit will have a close personal relationship with you forever. Now, forever is a long time. You might think, what person can be with me forever? Well, not a human person because they die. We are finite. So this, the only person that could possibly be uh, with us forever is a spiritual person who is eternal. Now, I told you before, every member of the Trinity has the full attributes of God, right? So that means that the Holy Spirit is fully God. And if you study the attributes of God, you're going to see these big, long words. They almost always start here that begin with the word omni. It's a Latin word for all. And so uh, what he's saying, Jesus, in this statement is that God is omnipresent. God is always everywhere, always able to be with you. He doesn't have, sp space isn't something that's a problem to him. He is everywhere uh, at the same time. He is with us here and he is with every other church and in every other place. And I don't know about you, but to me, that's a very comforting thought. Because no matter where I go or what I do, the God who loves me is with me. He's with you. And he's with you, and he's up here with me as I'm having to preach this or getting the privilege to preach and talk about them or talk about the Holy Spirit. You know, and I love the way David captures this in, in the Old Testament. He says uh, in Psalm 139, he says, where can I go from your spirit? And he, just, he just consigns himself to it. Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. And so he's everywhere all the time. And so he's everywhere at once. He's also, though, you've got to understand every when at once. Everywhere at once, he's also every when at once. So he not only transcends a space, but he transcends time. So he knows your past, he knows your present, he knows where you're going. He understands your future. He, you're not going to surprise the Holy Spirit because he also transcends time. And so when he says to us, uh, he will abide with us forever, he's inviting us into this very personal relationship that cannot and will not come to an end. We've all had relationships that have ended and have hurt us or we are gone. He's saying, I will send somebody who will be with you forever. And then he goes on to say something else about the Holy Spirit. This is what he says. He reveals this truth. He calls the Holy Spirit even the spirit of truth. 
He calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth. And what that means is it's an invitation. It's a revelation of the knowledge and understanding of God. Another omni word we use for, for God is omniscient. That's omni all and science knowledge. God is all-knowing. He knows everything. You're not going to fool God. He knows everything. So one of my favorite definitions of omniscience goes like this. It's the attribute of God by which God perfectly and eternally knows all things which can be known, past, present, and future. So think of God's intelligence this way. Does, what, what do you think God's IQ is, right? Silly question because the, he doesn't have an IQ. I, IQ means Q is quotient that it can be measurable. Bill Gates has 160. Einstein, 209. I heard 250 is the highest you can go. God's, you can't even measure that thing because it's unknowable. He knows everything. Think of God's intelligence this way. This might even be fun to write down and just ponder this one for a minute. For a minute. Uh, nothing has ever occurred to God. Nothing has ever occurred to God. You ever think about that? He never hit his head and goes, oh, I didn't think of that. He never went, oh, mind blown, wow. Right? That doesn't happen. You've never surprised him. He's never been like, oh, <laughs> look at you. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. It's not how it works. God knows everything. He just knows absolutely everything. I love how uh, this author, Robert Morris, puts it. He says, God is incapable of thinking uh, of, of something he's never thought of before. If he could, he might learn something. But God, who knows everything, has nothing to learn. And so what Jesus is telling the disciples is this Holy Spirit, he can be everywhere at the same time. He has all knowledge. He's totally with you. And it doesn't mention it in this text, but we also know that God is omnipres- or om- uh, omnipotent, which is another omni word, which means uh, all-powerful. And when, it, right away in the, in the Gospel of Luke, it says nothing is impossible for God. And so nothing means that nothing Everything is possible for God. He can do everything. He's all-powerful. So if the Holy Spirit has all the attributes of God and all these are true, then this is true of the Holy Spirit. This is who this comforter really is. There's nothing the Holy Spirit doesn't know. He is omniscient. There's no place the Holy Spirit doesn't exist. He's omnipresent. And there's nothing the Holy Spirit can't do. He is omnipotent. Now this is where it gets exciting. All right, this is where it gets exciting. Jesus says something about, once he explains who the Holy Spirit is, he says this line that helps you understand how close the Holy Spirit wants to be. And here's what he says. The Spirit of truth, this paraclete, the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you do. You know him for he dwells with you. And here's where it gets wild. He will dwell in you. He will dwell in you. Okay, this is where the Holy Spirit can be a comforter like nothing else. Right? He said the Holy Spirit, this is somebody we can know, not on an, an impersonal, but on the most intimate possible way you can. He's saying you can actually be indwelt or possessed, think of it like this, possessed by God the Holy Spirit. Now that might for us in church talk, we go, yeah, we've heard that. We use that language all the time. It wasn't like that to the uh, disciples. They were like, what? That's crazy because you know what? Back then the Holy Spirit would like pop in and out of people's lives, didn't live inside of people. You know where the Holy Spirit lived? The presence of God on earth dwelt in one place and they knew it. Everybody knew it. It was in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. They were close to it here. And there was this place called the Holiest of Holies in the middle of it. And there was a big curtain around this, this place. And you couldn't just kind of pop the curtain open and go, hey God, can we talk? No, once a year, a high priest could go in there and make a sacrifice. And it didn't often go well for that high priest because if they weren't ready, they would drop dead in there. The presence of God was a very serious thing. Well, a few days later, Jesus gets crucified and dies on the cross. You know what happens instantly when he dies? That curtain tears, rips open. And what that means is, no, God's now approachable. But it means more than that. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, went out from there and it went looking for a new temple. And you know what temple he found? The followers of Jesus who love him and obey his commands. So 50 days after he raises from the dead, on the first day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, tongues of fire come and they rest on 120 people who are followers of Jesus and they come out speaking a different language. Peter, he preaches one sermon and 3,000 people come to the Lord that day. The Holy Spirit from that day forward has been indwelling the people of God. But we forget this stuff really easily. And the early church did it too. It's so easy to hear something like that, but we forget it. Paul's talking to the church in Corinth not long after this happened. This is what he says. He says to them, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? 
That's why Jesus said, you guys, it's better that I go. I can only be with you in like this one time and place, but I'm sending you a Holy Spirit that is all the things I just mentioned to you, and he will live inside of you. I can only be with you a short time, but he will be with you always. He will live inside of us. You know, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know why? You ever think about how, do you, how does Christ strengthen me? He sent the Comforter. He sent us the Comforter. And if you're a follower of Jesus, the Comforter lives in you, lives inside you. The omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent Holy Spirit is always with you and in you. And he wants to be closer to you than you ever could possibly realize. He wants to be in a deeper relationship. He wants more of his power flowing in and through your lives than it is now. No matter where you're at in your relationship with the Holy Spirit, he wants to be closer with you. So what I want us to wrestle with is this question. Do you want a closer relationship with the Holy Spirit? He's made the first move. Do you want one? Now, I'll be honest, I'm wrestling with it myself. You'll obviously say, yeah, of course I would, but I don't know. You know, if I go back to that question I started with, who's the, the one person you could have dinner with? And for me, aside from Jesus, it would be, uh, it'd be my mom. It'd be my mom. I, uh, I lost her uh, in December. It'll be two years that she passed. And I had, I had a good mom who loved me a lot. And uh, I could go to her uh, with anything. If I was insecure or struggling, I could go and, and talk to my mom. She was my biggest cheerleader, my biggest fan. Uh, she was a comforter. She was a comfort to me. And you might think I'm a bit of a mama's boy with this. I don't care. Because I kind of was. Not anymore, but... I would go to their house on Friday. The way my work schedule is, is I work till about noon on Friday. Then I'll give my wife a break and I'll take my kids over to her house or my dad, mom and dad's house and I'll take a nap on their couch and eat their food. And they'll hang with my kids and I get a break. It's great. <laughs> but what I did in that, part of what I wanted was that after I'd get up from my nap and I'd sit, <clears throat> I'd often sit at the table with my mom or I actually would often sit at the, on, on the end of, edge of her bed with her. She had MS, she was often in her bed. And so I'd wake up and I'd go sit uh, on the bed with my mom, and I would just process life. And one of the last conversations we were having was about um, whether or not I should take a, the role as a teaching pastor here. I'd been offered it, and we were wrestling with, you know, I'd, I'd say, like, I, I'd, I'd be honest, like, I really, I don't know if I can do it. You know, I, I feel really insecure. What an easy thing to fail in. How embarrassing if I didn't do well in this role. And I could just say, you know, uh, Ma, you think I can do it? You know, you think your little boy has what it takes? You know, like I, the little boy in me, the vulnerable, scared little kid in me could come out and just say, hey, uh, what do you think, Mom? And um, if I needed comfort, she would comfort me, and she knew just what to do. And I wouldn't, I'd let her hug me. I'd lay my head on her shoulder. I could do that with her. But if I needed encouragement, I mean, she wasn't brave heart, but she, she would say, Joel, I believe in you. Like, I, I know you can do this. And she would speak that life into me. She knew just what to say. She knew how to blow wind into my sails. And, and to be honest with you, she never saw me step into this role because she died suddenly. I had actually sat at the table with her the Friday night, and the next morning she was gone. And it felt like somebody had just ripped a part of me uh, off. Like I had lost this one person in my life who I, I, I know loves me unconditionally and I know probably loved me more than anybody else. I could be myself with her and I, I think that was gone. And I felt such a loss, such a pain that my mom was gone. Like I didn't have that, that person. In fact, it was her birthday on Thursday, September 10th. She was born. She'd have been 71 years old. And I'm writing this message and I'm trying to think through my mom's stuff and I'm, and I'm, and I'm emotional. I'm this hot mess and I'm just struggling to figure out even what to say about this. And in the midst of all that, I hear the Holy Spirit just go, hey, hey, Joel, hey, you, you think I could be that person for you? I know you're struggling. I, I know you're hurting, but I'll never leave you. I won't die. I I know what you need. I love you. I'm closer than you think. Can I be your comforter? Can I be that person for you? He's saying the same thing to you. We've all lost people. We've all been disappointed. And the Holy Spirit's saying, I want to be your comforter. I don't care how close you think you are with the Holy Spirit. He's saying, I want to be closer to you. I want to be your comforter. Will you let him? I want to be honest about my journey and my story. Um, I answer that question. He's asking me the same thing. You know, I answer the question, that invitation with maybe, I don't know, 
I'm not sure I trust you. I'm not sure I trust you to comfort me. Because I, and I know that by my emotion or by, by the, my behavior because in, in my pain I've turned to other things to comfort me than the Holy Spirit. And to be honest with you, I've struggled to write this message because of it. Because what I've realized is in my turning to other things for comfort, I have not really come to know the Holy Spirit like I want to. Like I should. Sometimes I feel like I've got to stand up here and be the expert in front of all of you. Like I got it all figured out. But the truth is, uh, I'm not sure I understand or know the Holy Spirit like I, like, I, like I want to. So I just want to join you in this and be honest. Because as I've gone through this message, as I've prepared this message, the Holy Spirit's put his finger on some things in my life that says, these are in conflict with me, Joel. These parts of your life are in conflict with me. And I haven't wanted to deal with that stuff. I really haven't. And, uh, and it's hindering my relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so right now the Holy Spirit's asking me the same question I'm asking you to consider. Do you really want a deeper relationship with me? And my answer's been, yeah, as long as it's on my terms, I do. And it's not working. It's, it's just not working. Holy Spirit saying, I want a relationship on my terms with me. Not because he's a bully, not because he's some kind of dictator. He just loves us too much to let us figure out life on our terms. Because God knows that we're not omni anything. Not even close. He's omni everything. We're not omni anything. And he's saying, I can comfort you so much better than anything else you turn to. I love you more than anyone else you can turn to. I, I know everything about you. Will you just let me love you? Can I just wrap my arms around you? Can I speak life into you? Will you let me do that for you? Will you quit running to those other things? Will you stop denying the fact that I live inside of you? This God who has omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God lives inside of you and I want to connect with you. Well, we let him. And so I want to end today with some questions. I'm not going to have any big uh, application for you. I just want you to think about some things as we step into this series. And here's the questions uh, I'm wrestling with, and I'd like us to do this together. And so here are the questions I just want you to wrestle with. If you're online and you're, and you're watching with a group of people, maybe you want to talk about these after. Maybe on the car ride home, you guys could talk about these yourselves. But if they're too personal, just wrestle with them. And so here are the questions. What is your relationship like with the Holy Spirit right now? How would you describe it? Uh, do you actually want a deeper connection with the Holy Spirit? Ask yourself that. Do you? If this is true about who he is, do you want a relationship, a deeper one? Why or why not? Why, you know, think about that. And what might be hindering your relationship with the Holy Spirit? Are there other things you turn to for comfort? Because the Holy Spirit wants to be so much closer. There's a lot of lonely people out there right now. You might be feeling lonely. I at times feel very lonely. And the Holy Spirit's saying, I just want to be closer to you. Can I be that comforter for you? Let me end with this word of encouragement about the Holy Spirit from 2 Timothy. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. And I see a lot of fearful people out there right now. I see a lot of people struggling. They're scared and they're afraid. And, and the Holy Spirit, that's not the spirit of the... Uh, that's not the uh, the spirit uh, that God has given us. He's given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I want more of that. I want to live in more of the power and love of the Holy Spirit. I want that for you. I want that for our church. Because I see a vision of a church f of people who are full of the Holy Spirit. That the gifts of the Spirit are flowing in and through us. That we want more of that. But we have to pursue the Holy Spirit. He's made the move. We have to meet Him. Will we? And I want to invite you to do it because He is so good. And he is who I shared with you he is because that's who Jesus said. And he wants to connect with all of us on a deeper level. Let's pray. Thank you for sending your spirit, Father. And I'm sorry myself. I confess to you that I have often turned to other comforters, uh, other things to comfort me than your son, or than your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you make, make the presence of God God, the Holy Spirit, alive in all of us. Help us to see who the Holy Spirit is, how much you love us, how close you are to us. Uh, fill us with the power and love of the Holy Spirit and give us a hunger for you, God. Reveal to us the answers to these questions as they really are, Lord, and then give us a hunger for more of your Holy Spirit so that we might be the church you've called us to be, that we can live in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the power of anything else. And so I pray your Holy Spirit fall upon this church Fall upon each of our lives. Let us live in that power. I ask this, Lord, from you, according to your will, in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. Well, thank you, everybody. God bless you. We're going to keep going. There'll be four more weeks of this. If you want to talk or pray with a pastor, we'll be up here. If you want to pray for the Holy Spirit, talk about it. We're here. 
If there's a study guide online you can download, you want to dig into it more. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you here next week. God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Take care.